Well, this one's going to be some. <laughs> Jimmy Buffett, when he was writing this song, he said there was a woman that told him uh, the reason there's so many crazy people, fruits and nuts out there, as they said, is uh, perhaps that God took us out of the oven before it was quite time. <laughs> and uh, that's sort of the inspiration for this, this song called Fruitcakes. Fruitcakes in the kitchen Fruitcakes on the street You can see them on the boardwalk In the middle of the week Half-baked cookies in the oven Half-baked people on the bus There's a little bit of fruitcake Left in every one of us Paradise, lost and found Paradise, take a look around. I was out in California, where I hear they have it all. They got riots, fires, and mudslides. They got sushi in the mall. Water bars and brontosaurs and Hollywood stardust. Shake and bake life with the quake. All the secrets in the crust. Fruitcakes in the kitchen, fruitcakes on the street. You can see them on the boardwalk in the middle of the week. Half baked cookies in the oven, half baked people on the bus. There's a little bit of fruitcake left in every one of us. A oh, religion, uh -huh. religion. There's a thin line between Saturday night and Sunday morning. We're going to talk about it now. Here we go. Sing it, altar boys. May a Cooper, may a Cooper, may a Maxima Cooper. May a Cooper, may a Cooper, may a Maxima Cooper. Oh, where's the church? Who took the steeple? Religions in the hand of some crazy old people. Television preachers with bad hair and dimples. The God's honest truth is it's not that simple. It's the Baptist in you. It's the Methodist in me. It's the Lutheran in him. She's Catholic, ain't she? It's our brothers and sisters. It's the Muslim and Jews. Tell me what's going on. I ain't got a clue. Who thinks in the kitchen? Fruitcakes on the street. You can see them on the boardwalk in the middle of the street. The week half baked cookies in the oven. Half baked people along the bus. There's a little bit of fruitcake left in every one of us. Here come some big ones now. Relationships. What about that? We all got them. We all want them. But what do we do with it? All right, here we go. I'm going to tell you. She said you got to do your fair share. Now cough up half the rent. I treat my body like a temple. And you treat yours like a tent. But the right word at the right time may give me a little hug. That's the difference between lightning and a harmless lightning bug. Oh, it's fruitcakes in the kitchen, fruitcakes on the street. You can see them on the boardwalk in the middle of the week. Half-baked cookies in the oven, half-baked people on the bus. There's a little bit of fruitcake left in And the funny thing is that that is the song that originally inspired me to start this whole series, The Gospel According to Jimmy Buffett. Anyway, ironically, it's also the song that required the most editing for us to be able to do it on a Sunday morning. Um, but uh, it, I really appreciate Curtis uh, sharing his talent with us during these weeks. It has been a whole lot of fun for a whole lot of us. 
And I know that I've had a, a, some great conversations as a result of some of these sermons. And last week, I was having a great conversation with Hazel Parrish, who was telling me about the trip she took to New York with her daughter Leanne and granddaughter Erica. Uh, they took us part of the Make-A-Wish Foundation. And they went up there, they flew up to New York, got to see a Broadway show. Uh, they went on a shopping spree and uh, went to see all the sights. And one day after a long day of sightseeing, they'd been to the 9-11 memorial. And they were tired and ready to go back to the hotel. And they called. But they found out it would be a 90-minute wait for an accessible van. So rather than wait that 90 minutes, they decided to brave it and go ahead and ride on a regular city bus. Well, they got on the bus and they sat down. And these other women who were on their way home from work sat down next to them. And, you know, you know Hazel. You know how Hazel likes to talk. And Hazel has a very distinct way of talking. And it was very apparent to these two ladies from New York. And they asked Hazel where she was from. And when she told them, one of the ladies says, Oh, Lord, I've got to get to North Carolina. And then she looked up at Hazel and said, What are you doing here? <laughs> there is nothing here but immorality. This is a city of no morals. And, and, and eventually, of course, that led to them talking about the faith that they shared together. But now, can you imagine this? If this lady had decided to leave New York to find a community uh, that was more virtuous and respectable. And she left there and ended up here. <laughs> and then she ended up on the boardwalk. <laughs> you know, by the time she runs into some drunk bikers staggering out of a bar, some big guy wearing his rebel flag t-shirt and uh, some people wearing swimsuits that aren't really useful for actual swimming. <laughs> you know the ones I'm talking about. She might just be ready to go back to New York. <laughs> because, you know, the truth is, no matter where we are, there are always going to be some people who we look at and, and we think, well, that's different. And sometimes we look at people and think they're strange, or maybe we even put a judgment on them that they're sinful. You know, the first time I, I ever heard the, the song today, Fruitcakes, uh, all I could think of was our island. And I'm pretty sure he was writing it mostly about folks in Key West, and if you've ever seen or heard anything about Fantasy Fest, you'll, you'll pretty much know where he got the idea. But... As he sang about the fruitcakes all around us, all I could think of was all of those quirky individuals we have here on Pleasure Island. But this is what we have to remember. The fruitcakes aren't always them. After all, as the song goes, there's a little bit of fruitcake left in every one of us. Even in the church. Maybe even especially in the church. You know, we often like to think that we're the normal ones, right? And, and everybody else is kind of crazy. But we know that's not true. After all, the church is a hospital for sinners, not a museum for saints. And we're not any better or more normal than any other group of people out there somewhere. What we are, by the grace of God, is forgiven and set free. You know, I passed a church sign the other day that said, God wants spiritual fruit, not religious nuts. <laughs> but anyone will tell you that if you want a good fruit cake, you need fruit and nuts, right? <laughs> so what I'm trying to say here is that we shouldn't judge any other people a a as being any better or worse or even any crazier <laughs> than ourselves. People just are who they are. And it takes all kinds of, of people to make us who we are supposed to be. And I think that's what St. Paul was trying to say in the scripture for today, which is in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting with verse 12. And Paul says this, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, 
slaves or free. And we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now this particular scripture, it, it comes out of a section of writings where Paul was uh, addressing the behavior of lots of different people, and particularly their behavior in worship. And he was talking about all of the, the different spiritual gifts that individuals bring and how when they do that, the whole somehow becomes more than the sum of the parts. And Paul says that diversity is a good thing because all the different people in the church reflect the diversity of God's character. And then he gets into this illustration where he uses the body. And there were a lot of ancient writers who used this illustration of the body, but Paul uses it in a very different way than they did. You see, most of the times that this body simile was used in, uh, in writing as a rhetorical tool. It was as a reminder to those who were poor or of some low estate politically or socially that they had a place in society. And their place was one of subservience. Subservience to those who were of a higher standing, who were better than them. So Paul takes us and he flips it all on its head. He turns it around and he uses the idea of the body to instead emphasize how important all of the parts of the body are to the functioning of the body as a whole. And he especially says that those that seem less honorable or less significant are sometimes more important. Earlier in chapter 10, he says, because there is one bread, we who are many are one, for we all partake of the one loaf. You might have heard that before somewhere. <laughs> you see, by tying that image of the body to the Lord's table, he was reminding people that we are part of this body only by the grace of God. Since when we celebrate communion, it is all about God's grace. It's not because of any quality that we happen to possess as individuals. It's not about any strength that we might have, any gift that we might bring. It is about the unwarranted, unmerited, and unearned favor and love of God. We are all sinners in need of God's grace. We all share in the one loaf. But there's a little bit of fruitcake left in every one of us. So there's a strong warning here, not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought, not to look down on others, because we're not any better than they are. And we are also not to envy others, because here's the paradox. While none of us can function alone, and we're all just a, a part of the whole connected together in the one body, each one of us, every one of you, is valued and loved for the unique individual that God has created you to be. Hanging on the wall at Brits, and you know if you're local, the way to avoid the long line is to go to the camera to get served, right, Maxine? And there's a little picture in a frame on the wall that has a little kid, and it says, I know I'm special, because God don't make no junk. <laughs> Y'all seen that, right? You see, we need a, a healthy sense of the connection. 
the, the need that we have for each other. We need that to offset the rampant individualism of our, our culture. But at the very same time, we need to balance that with a, a, a clear sense of our value and our beloved uniqueness that has been given to us by God. It's not, our, not only our own value, though, that we need to recognize. We need to be able to see the glimpse of the image of God in everybody that we come across. Even if there is a, a little bit of fruitcake in them. Okay? However, we should especially, especially be able to see the, the, the gifts of our brothers and sisters who, who gather around the table with us. Because if you think about it, it's a miracle that we're here. It, it's a miracle that God brings all of us, our, our, our own backgrounds, our, our own junk, our, our, our own unique personalities. He brings all of us together and we worship together and we learn to, together. And we, we serve and fellowship together. You know, in a society that continues to divide people into different groups, that's always trying to set us up against them somehow, the church stands out as a witness to the power of God. Because it's realized in the power of our common humanity, linked in a common mission together. One of my friends recently uh, shared a statement from a, a church bulletin. And I just thought it was great. So great that I wanted to share it with you. And on the bulletin it said, We extend a special welcome to those who are single, married, divorced, widowed, gay, confused, filthy rich, comfortable, or dirt poor. We extend a special welcome to wailing babies and excited toddlers. We welcome you if you can sing like Andrea Bocelli. Or like our pastor who can't carry a note in a bucket. <laughs> we welcome you here if you're just browsing, just woke up, or just got out of jail. We don't care if you're more Christian than the Archbishop of Canterbury or haven't been in church since Christmas ten years ago. We extend a special welcome to those who are over 60 but not grown up yet. And to teenagers who are growing up too fast. We welcome soccer moms, NASCAR dads, starving artists, tree huggers, latte sippers, vegetarians, and junk food eaters. We welcome those who are in recovery or still addicted. We welcome you if you're having problems or you're down in the dumps or if you don't like organized religion. We've been there too. We offer a special welcome to those who think the earth is flat, work too hard, don't work, can't smell, can't spell, or because grandma's in town and wanted to go to church. We welcome those who are inked, pierced, or both. We offer a special welcome to those who could use a prayer right now, had religion shoved down your throat as a kid, or got lost in traffic and wound up here by mistake. We welcome tourists, seekers, and doubters, bleeding hearts, and you. I just thought that was great. Many of you may remember three years ago when I first arrived here, I held a series of listening sessions with different groups all around the church. And one of the questions I asked was, what is the one thing that you love most about St. Paul's? And over and over and over again, what I heard was, it is the friendliest, most welcoming church I have ever seen. And I don't want us to lose that. Well, you know what? I never want us to lose that either. I don't. We have something special here. Uh, because we appreciate people as the unique individuals that they are. That they have been created by God to be. And we realize that no matter how different they may seem, each person is a part of us. And we are part of them. Because we are all part of this one body. We need to celebrate our differences and even be able to laugh about them. One of my favorite quotes came from my devotional reading. It was written by a man named H.A. Williams. And he says this, Laughter is the purest form of our response to God's acceptance of us. For in laughter I accept myself, not because I'm some sort of super person, but precisely because I'm not. In laughing at my own claims to importance or regard, 
I receive myself in a sort of loving forgiveness, which is an echo of God's forgiveness of me. You know, there will always be differences within any group of people. There's going to be differences in opinions and beliefs, differences in experience, differences in your needs and your priorities. And that's okay. And we don't need to downplay those differences. Rather, we should celebrate them. Celebrate them because there may be a little bit of fruitcake left in every one of us. But a welcoming church is a tangible expression of the hospitality of our God. If you turn in your hymnals to uh, page 12, you see an expression of that hospitality. The hospitality that is expressed here at the Lord's table. Because in the United Methodist Church, our table is an open table. What that means is it's open to everyone. You don't have to be a member of St. Paul's. You don't even have to be United Methodist. You don't even have to be entirely sure about your faith. The founder of Methodism, John Wesley, said if they don't know Christ, invite them to the table anyway, for they may meet in there. And if you look on page 12 at the invitation to the table, I want you to read that first line with me. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him. Christ our Lord invites to his table all, all, all who love him, who want to live in peace with him and with one another. So he invites us to do that and invites us to confess our sin and bring it to him as well. So, if you will, please join me in our prayer of confession that's printed there. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the need. Forgive us, we pray. Free us with joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And there may be things that you need to offer up to God in confession on your own. Habits, hurts, and hang-ups that you want to lift in silence to God now. And I invite you to do so. <laughs>